that more than the words that you spoke to me. You carry the power to love and to heal right there in your own two hands. Try to be pleased in the Sometimes words will carry all you. But, but you, you have, have more than the words that you spoke to me. You carry the power to love and to heal right there in your own two hands. Let's do it again. Sometimes words will fail you, yes. But you have more than words to help with man. You carry
with divine wisdom as my ever-present internal guide, I recognize that I can never be truly lost or permanently stuck. Even if it seems that sometimes it might feel that way, I embrace all unknowns with poise, adjusting effortlessly to every new circumstance. I might be facing the most unforeseen obstacles or seemingly disruptive detours, such as divorce, loss of a job, or medical diagnosis. Whatever the challenging circumstances, <laughs> I do not become fearful or rigid. Aligned with spirit, I stay open-hearted, flexible, and calm. My life is always <coughs> supported by perfect love. Psalm 119.105 says, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Thank you. The uncle this may not be your exact theology. I came across some um, letters, you know, three letters to God that were written by children. So, it says, Dear God, I went to this wedding and they kissed right in church. Is that okay? <laughs> uh, dear God, in Bible times, did they really talk that fancy? <laughs> and I like, uh, I like L.A.D. He says, Dear God, I think about you sometimes even when I'm not praying. <laughs> And dear God, I bet it's very hard for you to love all of everybody in the whole world. There are only four in our family, and I can never do it. <laughs> <laughs> and this one, dear God, if we come back as something, please don't let me come back as Jennifer Horton because I hate her. <laughs> and then Larry said, dear God, maybe Cain and Abel would be able not to kill each other so much if they had their own rooms. <laughs> it works for my brother and me. <laughs> Dear God, we read that Edison made light, but in Sunday school they said you did. So I bet he stole your idea. <laughs> okay. Then one um, over here says, Dear God, if you watch in church on Sunday, I'll show you my new shoes. <laughs> and the lot, Dear God, thank you for the baby brother, but what I prayed for was a puppy. <laughs> yeah. That's good. I like that. Well, I knew we'd be talking about healing today, which is I'm already getting because one of my favorite subjects, of course. Um, and I should, I'm going to give a definition for spiritual healing because it might be a little broader than your custom. Spiritual healing is a movement toward a greater experience of wholeness. A movement towards a greater experience of wholeness. And so spiritual healing includes what we would call conventional healing conventional practitioners. It would also include alternative healing, because we're talking about healing the emotions, the mind, the body, the spirit, all of those. So hence, being a minister, I'm a healer. And if you are a nurse, you're a healer. If you are an energy moving person, you are a healer. If you are a therapist, you're a healer. Are you getting the drift of this? That really, when we were singing, that we had healing in our hands. We have it also in our words. We have it all different ways. So when we're talking about spiritual healing today, we're going to take a broad perspective because that is the truth of what we're talking about. And Robert Brummett, who's a wonderful unity minister, says healing occurs when we see every need for healing as an opportunity for greater awareness of our true nature and an opportunity to, to express more of our inherent wholeness. I like that. And so healing and symptoms, sometimes we still have symptoms, but we've already been healed and we had that experience. And I love this, I found this, and this is Dr. Larry Dosey, you might be familiar with him, and from Healing Words, and he said, even if prayer or attempts at trans a self-transformation fail in the course of an illness, there is still a sense in which a healing can always occur. By healing, I do not mean the physical disappearance of cancer, heart disease, high blood pressure, stroke, or something more, but something more marvelous. The realization that physical illness is at some level of secondary importance in the total scheme of our existence. Hmm. This is the awareness that one's authentic, higher self is completely impervious 
to the ravages of any physical ailment, whatever. The disease may regress or totally disappear when this awareness dawns for reasons we may not understand. And when this happens, it becomes as a gift, a blessing, a grace. But again, this is of secondary importance. The real healing is the realization that at the most essential level, we are all untouchables, utterly beyond the ravages of disease and death. More than healing, we need holding. W-H-O-L, you get me holding. And he says, holding is when we realize who we are beyond our bodies. Hmm. So I was thinking about that today. Of course, I said Unity is a healing ministry. It was founded as a healing ministry. Um, Myrtle and Charles Filmer, who were the co-founders, both had interesting uh, early lifetimes which required physical healing. Uh, Myrtle was as considered a semi-invalid. She was told that she had tuber inherited tuberculosis and she was very weak and frail for many years. And then uh, in 1886, she, you know, we talked the whole story before, but she heard a sentence said that struck a chord for her. It says, I'm a child of God and therefore I do not inherit, inherit sickness. I'm a child of God and therefore I do not inherit sickness. And you ever know when something catches your attention and, you know, and other people could hear it too, but it doesn't mean anything to them, but often you go, oh my gosh, what was that? Because you know it was for you in that moment to hear. She heard that, took it to heart, and it took two years for the symptoms to, you know, she was healed. She knew that her healing had changed because when she was able to take this belief into her heart, she was healed. Because she knew that where she was, she knew that she, who, who were, you know, her divine parents, if you want to think of it that way, where she inherited the truth about herself, she knew that. And then within a couple of years, the symptoms dissipated as well. That was her experience. Then meanwhile, Charles Gilmore, and of course we know he actually grew up in this area, probably over, probably over behind Sam's Club, um, is where he started out. And when he was 10 years old, he had a skating accident, and he dislocated a hip. Medicine was not what it is now. They were not able to treat it well. It, whether it eventually, like a lot of pain, uh, a lot of um, what we would now call medical malpractice, but back then that was kind of a good guess of I mean, how we might try and heal this. Anyways, it caused a lot of problems. His leg withered. By the time he died, and made his transition at age 94. Um, oh, his, when he, his leg was one much shorter than the other. But by the time he died, they were the same. I don't know if one shrunk or the other grew, but anyway, he was good, good at the end. Um, I'll never check that out. But, uh, and the, you know, there is, and I know I'm preaching the choir here, there is within us that pattern of perfect uh, perfection within us. We have a blueprint. Our body has a beautiful blueprint by which we create this wonderful earth suit that we live in. And we are these great self-healing mechanisms. And so I was thinking about what Myrtle said, and I was thinking about Charles' experience, and I came across Reverend Tony Stevens Coleman's um, little story. And she says, when she goes to the doctor, you know how they have you fill out that health form? You know, what, what is your mother's medical history? What's your dad's medical history and all that? She writes down, as a child of God, I do not inherit illness. And just skips that whole section. Oh, that must baffle people. <laughs> really, that must. And I, so I thought about that. I thought, well, that is really claiming the truth of who she is. And I was thinking back, because in my family, I grew up thinking that, because we have stories in our family about you inherit this or that. And you inherit my mother's family's circulatory system, which is not something you'd be really thrilled to have. My uncle had his first heart attack at 36, my mom at 54, blah, 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 blah. And, you know, and I grew up with that little fear in the back of my head. I know that. And then one day, Don to me, I got a whole other side of the family. Maybe I got my dad's arteries. Wouldn't that be much better? He lived to be in his 80s, and he was, unfortunately, a chronic alcoholic, and only had one lung, one kidney, blah, 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 blah. And he lived forever, so maybe I got him. <laughs> I thought, well, geez, all this time I've been so frightened that I was going to conk over. And it was like, good, I, you know, I could get pickles and still be fine. <laughs> so sometimes, if you're not going the route of writing on your medical form, I'm sorry, I'm not going to fill this out because I'm a child of God and do not inherit illness, 
when you choose to write out what those histories are, maybe it's just an affirmation where you go, you know, I don't have to have any of that stuff. Isn't that interesting that they had it, but it does not have to impact me in any way, shape, or form. So maybe we get to go with that. That'd be good. Um, I've, I've shared a lot of you. You, you people know more about me than you really need to know. <laughs> but, you know, you know I mean, I've had the, one of the reasons that healing is it's such a passion for me is because I've had a lot of experience of receiving healing in different ways. I shared with you I had narcolepsy. And how was that healed? That was healed through belief system and a lot of grace. And I shared with you that, oh, let's see, what were some of the other, I have to remember them now because I forget over time. Oh, yeah, my knees, remember I was hiking in Canada and looked up. You should never be hiking and looking up. You started to look where you're going. Went, boom, smashed my knees really good. And I'm, in the, I'm about hmm, four miles in. And um, how's, oh, I, I and the one person who was hiking with me was about the size of Mary Jo. Got it? Okay. <laughs> Not going to be carrying me out. And so what was I going to do? Of course, so what I did is I started talking to my knees and sending them love. Now, the gal I was with had no idea what I was doing, and she thought maybe I'd hit my head. Um, but it was okay. The point is, it healed my knees. I was able to walk out and then deal with it. It was great. I've had, uh, let's see. I had a bad back. How does that heal? That was healed by a past life regression. Yeah, so it'd be open. Uh, I've had, let's see, I was diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis. That was healed by denials and affirmations from unity. And I could go on and on and on. And things come up and things go. So this week it was interesting. I thought, okay, I'm going to be talking about healing. <laughs> what is going to be happening? Steve is laughing because he already knows. And so all of a sudden my neck and my ears blew up. <laughs> Not much, but it was and I went, okay, what is this about? And so it was, I was thinking, well, that's it's a good point. I'm going to be talking about healing, so I'm going to get to practice. I'll talk about that more in a minute. But it was just bringing to mind that, you know, and once you've had healing experiences, you get more confident, don't you? And your faith is in a knowing that we are in self healing vehicles that have the perfect blueprint and know exactly what to do, that there's a divine intelligence and wisdom in every cell in our body. Isn't that good news? There's a divine intelligence in all of us. And in this community, I know we've got lots of examples of healing. We've got people who heal themselves from cancers and paralysis and eyesight, arthritis, depression. Then it goes on and on and on that they have done that work for themselves. So um, we get to you know, support each other when we're going through those things. Because health is our naturalness, but illness seems to be part of the human condition at different times. And so it's not anything to fear, but it is just kind of lets us know that it's not our naturalness. Um, Charles Fillmore said, your degree of health is determined by your thoughts, past and present. I'd say that's good. And it's good, to, it's a good thing to go by because what that does, it tells me to, to, to be aware of what my thoughts are. But there's more going on than that. Sometimes we can use that and make ourselves feel guilty because you know, because illness happens, uh, diseases happen. It seems to be part of this human experience. So we want to be really gentle with ourselves. And I learned that really young. I had a very dear friend who uh, grew up who was was born cross-eyed, and she grew up in the Christian Science tradition. <laughs> and even though the practitioners probably didn't tell her this, she believed that there was something inherently wrong with her, that she was flawed or unworthy or something, because the practitioners would work with her to try to correct her eyesight, and it didn't work. So we want to be careful that we don't, you know, start, you know, when, when somebody, you know, sneezes, you don't turn to them and say, oh, what have you been thinking? You know, not, not that helpful. So just throw that out there. You know, and we, so... And we also have judgments that say to, to be disease-free is better than not being disease-free. Now, it's a preference, I get it. But, and, and when we get really caught up, because I don't know, any of you have five-year plans? They always used to teach me that you're supposed to have a five-year plan. At a certain point, you go, really? You think in five years you can even guess what's going to be happening. But, you know, so we had a five-year plan. And that probably, you know, for you might include two, two major vacations. Maybe try for one more child. Actually, this is not my plan. Um, <laughs> save for a new home. Maybe, but does your plan include plan for two minor outpatient surgeries and one major inpatient procedure? 
six weeks of chemotherapy, 14 months of psychotherapy. Uh, did you put that in? We don't put that in there. So when those things show up, we're surprised, it catches us off guard, and we become very fearful. It's a human reaction. But we want to look at, at that as just part of our evolution. And when it comes in, you know, what do we want to do with that? And when, it, when a healing is needed, I'm just kind of focusing on physical right this minute because that's more of the obvious for us. Move out of denial. It's really happening. Sometimes you have something going on. It was like I did spend a day going, oh, you know, the back of my ear won't fit in my ear anymore. I wonder what that means. No, it's probably nothing. And then, <laughs> yes, I have high and scratching and so forth. Something is going on. Get your attention. Pay attention. Okay. Also, but to know it's not permanent. It's just what's happening now. And it invites us to investigate to see what is happening, because if there's something going on in my emotions, in my mind, my thinking is correct, or my physical body, it's a little red flag that says, pay attention. There is something that is not, you know, that, that needs your love and attention. That's all it says. And so healing is a call to action. It doesn't mean you have to get frantic or panic. But it tells you it's a priority. And sometimes, you know, in our family, they have heart attacks. And so, a heart attack gets your attention, and you know what? If you have a heart attack, nobody expects you to do what you had planned on your calendar that day. They let it go. They say, you know, you're going to just deal with that right now, nothing else. But if you have some other things going on, people expect you to continue, or people, we expect ourselves to continue just like normal. You know, it's only, it's only minor depression. It's only, you know, whatever it might be that's going on, it's only grief only. You're my onlys. And so we don't deal with things in a timely manner. We say, well, I'll put that off and I will deal with that later. You know, it's just a minor ulcer, and I imagine if I drink a glass of milk, it'll go away and I'll deal with it later. What? You know, so when we have things that come into our lives, it is letting us know that there is something that is out of sync. And so we get to tend to that. It, so what's happening to you is not your enemy, but it's also not your natural state. And it's inviting us to simplify, to focus on what's important right now. And that might mean shifting our priorities from what they thought, what I thought they were going to be. And sometimes when things come into our lives, they require us to put all of our attention on our healing. And I had a dear friend named Bill, and this was out in California, and he was diabetic. He, uh, every, anyways, he needed a kidney transplant, and he was a, a diabetic. And he was becoming very, very ill. And it was interesting, he was weaker and the illness was impacting him greater. He had to uh, you know, pay more attention to what he ate. He had to pay more attention to lots of areas of his life. Uh, he had to deal with the insurance, which was really interesting at the time. He needed to get on the transplant list, and he was running into obstacles with that. And that's how I kind of got involved in it, because he was asking for a reference letter for it to get on the transplant list. Because back then, if you were in recovery, they didn't know if they wanted to bother to give you anything, because you, know, you really didn't deserve it. It was a long time ago. But anyway, and then he had to work with them. They finally found his sister was a match for him, so she would be able to give the transplant, but they would not operate on her because she was overweight. And so he had to be her coach to help her to lose weight so that she could, you know, it was very, it was like, he's doing all of this work at a time when it appears that he has the least amount of energy to do it. Have you ever had that experience? When something comes up in your life and you're like, my gosh, I just can't deal with one more thing, and it seems like I've got six. It requires us to focus and know that if it's mine to do, I will have what is needed to make that happen. And what is needed to make that happen may be able to, maybe to get help from others. That's another great benefit of when we need healing, is that it invites us to invite other people into our lives. And that might be one of the more powerful things that happens for me when, when dis-ease comes in, is it invites me to seek out wisdom from others, to seek support, whatever that might be. You know, it was like, my eyes thing that broke up were great, Stephen gave me a back rub, life is good. You know, I, I asked for that, I said, you know, I need some distraction. Worked out great. That's a minor example, but you know, for major examples, we, we get to help each other. 
And then we let go of the time frame, because sometimes we have healing that we would like to have happen really soon. I don't know if you've ever had that experience. Oh, I remember, yeah, one of the things. Yeah, and the shoulder that was kind of giving me, it was, it was, um, I overextended it and it didn't like it. And it took a couple years for that to come back. And it's like, well, I really would like that to come back in a couple weeks. And it didn't, you know, it didn't happen like that. So we learn patience and we give these opportunities. And one of the big things is not to limit how the healing is going to show up. It used to perturb me when healing would happen from a healer that I wasn't terribly impressed with. Or, you know, sometimes, and so it's being open to that internal wisdom that tells us what needs healing. Because our internal wisdom will tell us where to go. It'll tell us to go to our, our general practitioner and seek that wisdom. But remember, when we go and seek the wisdom, we don't have to take on the whole belief system. So if, a, if whether I go to a conventional healer or a non-conventional healer, I will take what fits for me, and I know I don't have to take it all on. So when I, I got quiet this week, because it was like, OK, my ears can't get too much bigger. They look pretty good now, I know. But trust me, it was interesting. And so I said, OK. So I got quiet to listen to what it was. I was really hoping I didn't develop an allergy to the peanut butter cookies I just made. It was, it was really a big concern. And that's probably why I put it off checking for an extra day. So that, oh my gosh, it's going to be peanut, something, some ingredient in those cookies. I'm just having a temporarily, you know, adverse reaction to. Darn. So I didn't check it out. Well, it turned out it wasn't the cookies. Oh, thank God. And so uh, that made my day. And then I just went off. The, and so I was like, I, I just came to the wisdom ask good questions and figured out what it was. And, it was, and, it, and I'm not going to tell you what it was because I'm not going to give a bad name to anything that's just for me. Uh, but it was an ingredient in one of my mother's recipes that I had made. And I had managed to eat probably four days this past week because I made a lot. And it was like, OK, good information. May not happen ever at all. Check next time. But it'd be a good thing for me to do. And I paid attention. That's some incredibly minor. And that's why I like to share the story of um, Morris Goodman. And I've shared it with you before. He's called The Miracle Man. And you can check him out on YouTube. And he was a, a pilot <laughs> a man in, in 1981. So you kind of get the idea. Okay, that, that's ways back. He was 35 years old. He was flying a Cessna, and it crashed. And he was seriously, seriously injured. C1 and C2 were fractured. He could not breathe on his own. He could not swallow on his own. He was on a machine. He could blink. That was it. And as he tells the story, it's a wonderful story, he talks about how he heard the doctor saying, well, I think he's going to be a vegetable. Imagine what that would be like if you're hearing that someone say that you knew you want to shout at them. No, I hear you. Um, but he had some wonderful baseline knowledge. And he said in 1970 he had read Napoleon Hill's Think and Grow Rich, which is a book about what your mind can conceive you can achieve. And so he, he knew that. And so he said what he did he kept saying to himself, once you have your mind, you can put anything back together again. If you have your mind, you can put anything back together again. And so he would, in his mind, imagine himself being able to breathe. He's not breathing too. He's not, yeah. He's being breathed. And he imagined himself being breathed. And eventually, they were able to take him off uh, the breathing machine, and he could breathe on his own. And he kept progressing. And he, in his own mind, he was communicating through blinking. And he blinked to them that he was going to be out of the hospital by Christmas. He crashed in March. That he was going to walk again. Now, this is a man, one and two, those of you know, know that. That is, usually they will tell you that does not work well, bode well for getting much going later on. He gradually works to where he could eventually swallow, he could eventually speak. And eventually, and by Christmas time, he walked out of the hospital with help. He had, you know, he was using crutches, etc. He was able to walk out of the hospital. He said it didn't matter what the others thought. He says man becomes what he thinks about himself. I love that. 
So he's one of my favorite stories always. And then I found another wonderful unity minister, <coughs> Reverend Joy Weiler. And she says, we're born into the human condition perfect. Perfect for demonstrating the power of our divinity. That's why we don't look like <laughs> the same shapes, sizes, anything. We're all are perfect for expressing our divinity. And that is probably something that comes up for her a lot because she was born with dwarfism and she's under four feet tall. And I, would, I see her at the conventions and, and I used to see her at Unity Village a lot. Wonderful woman. But she said people used to come up to her and say, my gosh, are you working on healing? And she's going, healing what? <laughs> because we will assume that we, are, we have a vision of what the perfect human earth suit should look like. And there's all kinds of varieties. You can just look around here, we can see some of those. It's beautiful. We are supposed to be alike. And so I always appreciate that from her. You know, that she says that it's it's knowing the truth of who you are, and that's what brings the healing. The healing is when we get back to knowing that we are these amazing divine beings. And when we do that, that sets everything in motion and those energies flow freely, and we are better than ever before. So, when I look back over some of the diseases or illnesses that I've experienced, I found some great benefits. One of them, I got to spend time with me some of those times. Uh, sometimes it, it, it was an opportunity to reinforce my understanding of healing. It allowed me to love myself and my various body parts even more. I would talk to them. Uh, it allowed me to simplify my schedule, to ask for help. It helped me to feel incredibly loved. So these turned out to be a wonderful gift in my way of thinking. And so I wanted to just share with you one of the healing letters. Myrtle used to uh, receive letters from people who would ask her about healing. So this is one of her responses. The Creator is now breathing its purifying, vitalizing, cleansing breath of life into each cell and fiber of your body filling you with strength that is a barrier to any and every appearance of negativeness. There is no such thing as an incurable disease in the body. Anything which does not measure up to the Christ pattern of perfection can be changed. The power that created you is always at work to restore you and maintain you in wholeness. Now that you are coming into the understanding of these principles, and learning how to cooperate with your indwelling healer, you are made whole and well in every part. With your eye of faith, you see yourself continuously manifesting purity, harmony, and wholeness in every part of your body. Think of your organism as being the pure life and substance of spirit made matter. Keep your mind filled with joyous, constructive, beautiful, health-producing thoughts that maintain harmony in both mind and body. And when your mind is peaceful, the healing energies flow through your whole being freely and abundantly. Sincerely yours, Myrtle Fillmore. I love that. When your mind is peaceful, the healing energies flow through your whole being freely and abundantly. And so I guess that is my wish for you today and for me this week is that I recognize the peace in my own mind and I invite it to go and inhabit and infuse with love every single cell in my body. And I am well and whole. And so it is. Let the floor and the chair support you completely. And as you exhale in readiness for the next deep inhale, know that you are in the perfect place right now, right here, having this experience. Know that you may choose to follow my you may choose to go elsewhere. Wherever you go will be perfect. And with every breath I take, 
I breathe in the life of the one source. And because I know this truth, I understand that cell by cell, my body is constantly revitalized and renewed. My mind becomes calm. I am one with spirit, one with the healing power of the divine. My body is a temple of the divine, and it was created for life. I was made perfect, the perfect me, not like anyone else, but the perfect expression of life as me. I know that I am already complete and whole inside. I know my inheritance is health and wholeness. I do not entertain any thoughts of myself or those I love as being subject to illness of any kind. In my mind's eye, I see the healing light of spirit blessing and renewing me and blessing and renewing everyone. In this quiet time, I center my mind and heart and know that healing is taking place right here, right now. I declare the divine life energy within as the one presence and power in my life. Healing is taking place all the time in me. It doesn't matter whether I'm awake or asleep. Nor does my age determine or diminish my life. Because God's healing power is as much a part of me today as it was on the first day of my life. My body is nourished and supported by the life-giving presence of spirit. That's in the air I breathe, the food I eat, and the water I drink. I bless these substances as they bless my body, knowing that the essence of God is within them is what truly sustains me. I know that there is no such thing as an incurable disease in the body. <coughs> Anything which does not measure up to the divine pattern of perfection can be changed. The power that created me is always at work to restore me and maintain my wholeness. And as I embrace more and more understanding of the divine principles, my faith makes me whole and well. With my eye of faith, I see myself continuously manifesting purity, harmony, and wholeness in every part of my body, my mind, my emotions. Think of my organism as being the pure life and substance of spirit made manifest. I keep my mind filled with joyous, constructive, beautiful, health producing thoughts that maintain harmony in body and mind and spirit. And because my mind is peaceful, the healing energies flow through my whole being freely and abundantly. The life-giving presence of the divine infuses every cell of my body, ensuring that wholeness and wellness are mine. And as I meditate on this thought, Feel that.
you like, you can do a little gentle stretch. Do watch out for your neighbors. The healing team, let them light out the, the pre medicine light. <laughs> this song is called uh, Let the Sun Shine Out. There's a couple of songs previously called uh, Let the Sun Shine In, so this is the, the exhale or the inhale. I read songs for myself <laughs> to support myself and hope that there was something for somebody else. So uh, that's where this came from. I'll sing a chorus and uh, sing with me right away if you've heard it before. But uh, otherwise, listen and I hope you'll uh, sing as I repeat the chorus. I let the sun shine out, it's mine to give away. Right up, I'll be 